Well, here we are, looking at the fourth passage in this series. And as y'all who've been here know, we've been talking about the appearances Jesus made after the resurrection for the last few weeks or so. And we started by looking at the Gospel of Matthew and talked about how Jesus gave what's called the Great Commission to his disciples, which, by the way, includes us. And then during the next two weeks, we turn to Luke and discuss the revelation Jesus made to those two guys on the road to Emmaus and how we might become ready to receive and respond to revelations ourselves. And then we considered all the stuff he gave his disciples when he appeared to them, including the promise of the Holy Spirit, something that for the evangelist Luke was fulfilled 40 days after the resurrection. As he wrote in the book of Acts, on the day of Pentecost, all the, follow the Lord's followers were together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the sound of a mighty wind. It filled the house where they were meeting. Then they saw what looked like fiery tongues moving in all directions, and a tongue came and settled on each person there. The Holy Spirit took control of everyone, and they began speaking whatever languages the Spirit let them speak. Now, this will be our focus on June 8th, which is Pentecost. But you know, it's interesting, Pentecost wasn't the only story dealing with the coming of the Holy Spirit, not in the New Testament. Of course, it's the one we usually think about, at least those of us who have been around the church for a while. And you know, this day of Pentecost, well, is actually more important than we generally assume. For example, it's the only Sunday when these cloths, and they're called paraments, are read. And I'll tell you, that day became the name for a whole movement that focused on the spirit. And in particular, the ability to speak in a spiritual kind of language, a movement called Pentecostal. As a matter of fact, if Christmas celebrates the birth of Jesus, the day of Pentecost marks the birth of the church. Because without what happened to those disciples on that day, there really wouldn't be any church. No ecclesia at all. Trust me, the coming of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost was extremely important. But for as important as Pentecost was and should be for Christians then and now, this story of the Holy Spirit in the Gospel of John is often overlooked and neglected. In fact, as we'll see in a little bit, the gift of the Spirit is actually overshadowed by something else that happened a little while later in the passage. And since this was all part of Jesus' first appearance to the disciples in John, at least after he appeared to Mary Magdalene, right outside the empty tomb, this morning we're going to talk about the inspiration Jesus offered and what that inspiration did for the people back in the day and how it affects us right here and now. And like I said, as John wrote it, all this business about the Holy Spirit was actually overshadowed. It took a back seat to something else, or maybe better, someone else. I mean, let me ask you all a question. Let me ask you all a question. How many of you all have heard of the Apostle Thomas? The Apostle Thomas. Good. And what's the word we generally use when describing Thomas? Doubting, right? Doubting Thomas. Man, you don't even have to be in the church to know the doubting Thomas. Now, I've got a gut feeling that's not the word he would have chosen for himself. What do you think? It's sort of like those nicknames that people way back in, in the day used to give to kings. Man, for every Richard the Lionhearted and Ivan the Fair and Lorenzo the Magnificent, there was a Louis the Sluggard or a Henry the Fat. Or as, Hispanic, or as his Hispanic friends called him, El Gordo. Or Vlad of La Valencia, who was called the son of the dragon, or Dracula. I mean, just imagine how much little Avelo of Bulgaria was picked on by the other kings when he picked up the nickname, the Cabbage. Man, it's as bad as Jeff Goldblum being forever known as the fly or Drew Barrymore as the fire starter. My goodness, although it wasn't great, I think Thomas would have preferred his other nickname, the twin. But it was doubting that stuck. 
Of course, the reason for this was based on how the evangelist John described something that happened after not only the resurrection itself, but also after Jesus had already appeared to the rest of the disciples. Just listen. Although Thomas the twin, see, Thomas the twin, was one of the twelve disciples, he wasn't with the others when Jesus appeared to them. So they told him, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas said, first I must see the nail scars in his hands and touch them with my finger. I must put my hand where the spear went into his side. I won't believe unless I do this. Now, that's what happened. And in my opinion, Thomas was actually pretty lucky to be tagged with doubting. I mean, let's get real. He could have been called Thomas the Jerk. Or Thomas the Know-it-all. Or Thomas the Loser. Or Thomas the Cabbage. Well, maybe not Thomas the Cabbage. My gosh, right when the other disciples were all excited about seeing the resurrected Jesus, Thomas was having none of it. Instead, man, instead of giving them the benefit of the doubt, he wasn't going to buy that story unless he could see and touch the nail scars in his hand, hands and put his own hand in Jesus' side. Now, I don't know about you, but that's just plain nasty. But only then would he believe. What a jerk. What a know-it-all. What a cabbage. To say he doubted, in my opinion, is actually an act of kindness. But you know, before we're too tough on Thomas, I think it's important to remember that when he said this stuff, he was really lacking something pretty important. I mean, he didn't have something that not only the other disciples had, but we also have ourselves. You see, I think he, you could say that he lacked the inspiration to believe. And this is something we can see in the passage that comes right before what we just read. And I'm talking about Jesus' first appearance to his followers. Now, this was what John wrote. The disciples were afraid of the Jewish leaders. And on, and on the evening of that same Sunday, they locked themselves in a room. Suddenly, Jesus appeared in the middle of the group. He greeted them and showed them his si hands and sides. When the disciples saw the Lord, they became very happy. After Jesus had greeted them again, he said, I am sending you just as the Father has sent me. Then, and I want you to listen to this, then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they will be forgiven. But if you don't forgive their sins, they will not be forgiven. Now, do you see what I'm talking about? When Jesus breathed on the disciples and gave them the Holy Spirit, Thomas wasn't there. And given what Jesus had already said about the Spirit, what the Spirit was going to do for him, this is a big problem. For example, this is what Jesus said before his arrest. Jesus said to his disciples, If you love me, you will do as I command. Then I will ask the Father to send you the Holy Spirit, who will help you and always be with you. The Spirit will show you what is true. The people of the world cannot accept the Spirit because they don't see or know Him. But you know the Spirit who is with you and will keep living, keep on living in you. And a little later, He said, I will send you the Spirit who comes from the Father and shows you what is true. The Spirit will help you and will tell you about me. Then you will also tell others about me because you have seen, you have been with me from the beginning. And finally, Jesus said, I am sending, I am, I'm sorry, I am saying this to you now so that when the time comes, you will remember what I have said. I was with you at the first and so I didn't tell you these things. But now I'm going back to the Father who sent me and none of you Ask me where I'm going. You are very sad from hearing this. But I tell you that I am going to do what is best for you. That's why I'm going away. The Holy Spirit cannot come to help you until I leave. But after I'm gone, I will send the Spirit to you. The Spirit will come and show the people of this world the truth about sin and God's justice and judgment. The Spirit will show them what they are, uh, the Spirit will show them that they are wrong about sin because they don't have faith in me. I have much more to say to you, but right now it would be more than you could understand. 
The Spirit shows what is true and will come and guide you into full truth. The Spirit doesn't speak on its own. He will tell you only what he has heard from me, and he will let you know what's going, what's going to happen. The Spirit will bring glory to me by taking my message and telling it to you. Everything that the Father has is mine. That is why I have said the Spirit takes my message and tells it to you. You see, Thomas the jerk, doubting Thomas, simply lacked the Holy Spirit. This source of insight and power and peace. He lacked what the other disciples had received from Jesus. As a matter of fact, he lacked the same thing that we've been given. Because I'm telling you right here and right now, whether you want to, whether you want to see it as coming down in tongues of fire or through the breath of Jesus, we've been given the same Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you how we can know that. It's because that's the reason we're here today. Because the Spirit has opened our eyes and our minds and our hearts so that we could see and understand and believe something that we couldn't before. But more than that, the Spirit is the reason that the command Jesus gave his disciples also applies to us. First, when he said, But I am giving you a new commandment. You must love each other just as I have loved you. If you love each other, everyone will know that you are my disciples. And then second in the passage we just read, when he said, I am sending you just as the Father has sent me. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they will be forgiven. But if you don't forgive their sins, they will not be forgiven. You see, the same Spirit that inspired those disciples on whom Jesus breathed, I'm telling you, it also inspires us. But not Thomas, at least not yet. Of course, that changed soon after the doubting. John wrote, a week later the disciples were together again. This time Thomas was with them. Jesus came in while the doors were still locked and stood in the middle of the group. He greeted his disciples and said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand in my side. Stop doubting and have faith. Thomas replied, you are my Lord and my God. Jesus said, Thomas, do you have faith because you have seen me? The people who have faith in me without seeing me are the ones who are really blessed. Now, that's what ended up happening to Thomas. And since in these verses he made the most complete confession of who Jesus was and is, yet made in the entire gospel, maybe it might be a good idea to back off the doubting a little bit. In other words, maybe we should decide to take a higher road, especially given the fact that since we believe without actually seeing Jesus, we're the ones who are really blessed. But whether we decide to do that or not is, is actually irrelevant. Because what's important isn't really what Thomas did and said. You see, as we consider the resurrected Jesus, I think it's crucial to focus on what Jesus did and said. Namely, that he breathed on them and he breathed on us and we've been given the Holy Spirit. And that he sent them and us out into the world and told us to reflect his light by loving others as we've been loved. I'm telling you, this we can do because we've been inspired. And next week we'll talk about the challenge that Jesus gave Peter and that he has given us. Amen. Amen.